All right, Dennis. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out. My name is David G. I am a grateful recovering alcoholic and a lustaholic. I'm grateful for a recovery date in both of those programs, uh, AA of August of 94 and SA of October 1st, 2019. It's been a lot of weeks we've been doing this, and I'm really grateful that you guys have come out to join us on this last one. We're going to finish up today on pages 100 through 103, working with others. And usually the first seven chapters is, is all that we ever did in any book studies that I participated in. A lot of people has asked me, you know, why don't you go ahead and read the rest of the book and go through the book like that? It was just something that we'd never done. Those chapters are very important. I do believe that they are there after the spiritual experience takes place. It shows me how to live because there is a chapter to the wives. I spend a lot of time with my wife. There is a chapter to the employer. I spend a lot of time with my employer and there's a vision for you. And so those are other areas of life after recovery. And I'm not ruling out at all that those are important chapters to go through. It's just in any book study that we've ever done, we always end right here at working with others. And it seems like that we started sometime back in June with this. So it's been almost nine months. You know, we took a little break during Christmas time there. And, you know, we've missed a few, you know, due to COVID and different things that's happened in my life. But for the most part, we've stayed pretty much on track with it. And I'm so grateful to the ones that have continued to come out here every week for this. There's a whole lot of things you could have been doing on Sunday, but you came here every week for this. And I'm truly grateful I am. You know, we've just got a few pages to cover today, but mainly I'd like to hear from you. I would like to hear not only questions about the book or any of this, but I'd like to hear your experience. Has this been helpful for you? Has it helped change things in your recovery moving forward that you'll be able to share with other people and in your own walk? You know, I, I really want to hear from you because you guys are the ones who have made this possible for me. Coming over, I wasn't sure about doing this. I had never done one outside of the Fellowship of AA, but I can tell you it's been very good. It has changed my sobriety, my recovery. It's changed my life. I've been able to uh, really, really dive into the book in a, in a much deeper way than I ever was able to before. And now I see how it applies to every problem that I have. So I, uh, again, want to thank you. And I just want to pick up where we left off last week, which is on page 100. We're going to start in the middle of the page and we're just going to kind of read through over to 103 to the end. I'll share my experience, strength and hope with you like we do each week. And then at the end of it there again, I would love to hear from you if you want to do that. If not, then I understand that as well. So let's pick up right there in the middle of the page. When working with a man and his family, you should take care not to participate in their quarrels. Now, I've done some of that in AA, and I promise that when this book suggests that, that's a very good suggestion because really it's none of my business about their quarrels for one thing. But I had a lady, I, I used to have women that would call me about their husbands, and I would talk to them, and well, he needs to do this, and maybe you should do that, and any of that. But I don't do that anymore. I, I try not to participate in any of that because for one thing, it's none of my business. The book says avoid meeting a man through his family when possible. I definitely try to do that. I'm anxious to talk to him. I have one guy sponsor, and, and he tells me all the time, well, I got to run this by my wife. I need to go talk to my wife. There's a certain way that my wife wants me to work my program. And I told him, you know, I, you know, no offense, buddy, but uh, you might already ask her to be your sponsor because, uh, you know, the way that we're going to do this is outlined right here between you and me, not you, me, and her. And I didn't say that to be rude and by no stretch of the imagination, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to work with a man and his wife. I'm going to work with the man himself. So I'm careful not to participate in their quarrels. And here's why, you know, I may spoil a chance of being helpful if I do urge upon the man's family that he's been a very sick person and should be treated accordingly. You should warn against arousing resentment or jealousy because we know for the alcoholic and the sexaholic, the resentment, jealousy, and all that stuff is the number one offenders. They are the most common enemies that lead us back to relapse. It says you should point out that his defects of character are not going to disappear overnight. Now, I know this to be a fact. I've been around this program for a lot of years, almost three decades now. And I can promise you that uh, defects of character do not disappear overnight just as a result of going through this work. And I think sometimes, and I know in my own case, uh, in the beginning, that was a big mistake for me to try to promise sponsees things 
that was going to happen for them. Hey, if you'll do this, if you'll work up through this work, you do this, you do this, this will happen. That's me playing God. I don't, I don't have any right to tell him that. My job is to guide him through the 12 steps as outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what happens there is between him and God, not, not me and him. So I try not to make any of those promises. Show them. Don't tell them, but show them that he has entered upon a period of growth. Ask them to remember when they're impatient, the blessed fact of his sobriety. Now, that's hard in SA. I know it was for me. Thank God that I'm sober today, but I've left a lot of damage behind me. And those are things that I'm going to spend a lifetime trying to repair. So, you know, for me, just to tell my wife, you know, especially in the beginning, hey, don't be so impatient. Just uh, be blessed by the fact that I'm sober today. That probably would not have went off very well in my household, I promise you. So, you know, there's some things that we're going to be looking at in these next couple of pages. Now, with the alcoholic, that's one thing, but with the sexaholic, it's quite another. So there are some things in these next couple of pages, especially with the sexaholic, that I try not to do today. And I'll point those out as we go. The book says, if you have been successful in solving your own domestic problems, and I think that's a big one. I, I once, my very first sponsor in AA was a full blood Choctaw Indian guy. And he was a, just a great man. He still is a great man. He's, uh, you know, he's uh, been successful in every area of his life, except for this one right here with the domestic problem. He just never could seem to get that under control in his own life. So it was really hard for him to show me how to practice the principles and, and to be of service here because he could never do that himself. However, I have met many men since that time who has been successful in solving their own domestic problems, and they've been a very big help to me. Tell the newcomer's family how that was accomplished. In this way, you can set them on the right track without becoming critical of them. The story of how you and your wife settled your difficulties is worth any amount of criticism. Today, I'm absolutely okay with doing that, sharing that with other people. She is okay with me doing that with other people today. Now, that wasn't the case in the beginning. It is now. Now, assuming we are spiritually fit, we can do all sorts of things that alcoholics are not supposed to do. Now, I'm not going to make any suggestions here for the sexaholic to do some of these things. In fact, I was on the Monday, Thursday, not too long ago. I think we were covering this, actually. And it dawned on me there's some things that they're going to say that the alcoholic, you know, it's okay for him to do. But as sexaholics, there's some things that we probably shouldn't do. And in my case, I'm not going to do. And here's one. People have said we must not go where liquor is served. Now, I don't see that as a problem in my life today. I've been sober for almost 30 years in Alcoholics Anonymous. When I walk into a store or I walk into somewhere where there's liquor, it doesn't really seem to bother me. But that's not the case whenever it comes to lust. There is something about that that I don't want to put myself in a place to where temptation is going to come to get me. I don't want to be naive enough to think that just because I went through these steps, I've got a little over a year and a half of recovery here now, that that can't come back to get me this early on. Now, will it always be that way? I don't know. If my experience here is the same as it's been in AA, maybe not. But you know what? I'm not going to take that chance. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to go where I can put myself into a temptation like that. It says we must not have it in our home. We must shun friends who drink. For me in the SA, I try not to shun friends that, that are still practicing that way of life. I don't hang out with them, though. Now, if we're in, we run into each other, we have a conversation, that's one thing, but I'm not going to be looking up to get any advice about anything. So we must avoid moving pictures, uh, which show drinking scenes. Now, I don't know about you, but I know about me, and it's probably a good idea that I avoid some of these scenes. And uh, so it says we must not go into bars. I can remember early on, I was less than a year sober in AA, and I was at a conference in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was a beautiful conference, and that evening, uh, that evening there was a dance, and uh, man, I was all for that. I was ready to get out there and, and this, but they had some some lady up there, man, and the way she was singing, I tell you, it sounded like they were butchering a hog in that room, and uh, it was just terrible. She was just awful, and uh, bless her heart. But uh, anyway, I thought, man, I can't stand another minute of this, so I walked outside and I walked down the hall and I looked off to the left, and there was a bar there. And that looked very attractive. You know, I thought, hey, I can go in there and drink some Dr. Peppers and shoot some pool, and it'd probably be okay. It'd sure be better than what I was hearing back up the hallway there. And so uh, 
a couple of friends came by. We talked it over. Uh, we, we prayed the serenity prayer before we went in, and we did go in that night and shoot some pool. But, you know, we did take some measures on being there. However, I don't want to I don't want to chance that here at all. So it says our friends must hide their bottles. If we go to their houses, we mustn't think or be reminded about alcohol at all. Now, our experience shows that this is not necessarily so. And it's not necessarily so probably over here. I just know for me, I'm speaking for me. We meet these conditions every day. An alcoholic who cannot meet them still has an alcoholic mind. And there again. With AA, I'm completely comfortable right there today with that. I'm not going to chance that here. There is something the matter with his spiritual status. That may be the case. But if there is something the matter with that, that's okay. At least I'm not going to escalate it by acting out just because I was stupid enough to believe that I could go in there without any danger. His only chance for sobriety would be someplace like the Greenland ice cap. And even there in Eskimo might turn up with a bottle of scotch and ruin everything. And I had some friends that that this did happen to. They showed up and uh, and they had liquor on them. And and this guy was trying to shield himself. He was trying to hide away. And we know as sexaholics, uh, that's not very good for us. You know, anytime we try to isolate and hide from this problem, it seems to find us no matter where we're at. And the deal is, an Eskimo doesn't even have to show up because he's liable to show up right here in my mind, or she is. And uh, that's uh, you know, I have to be careful with that. Ask any woman who has sent her husband to distant places on the theory he would escape the alcohol problem. In our belief, any scheme of combating alcoholism which proposes to shield the sick man from temptation is doomed to failure. You ever try to do that with your sponsees? You ever try to hide them out in the fellowship or in meetings? You ever try to cover them up with different steps? You ever come up with all these other ideas that they should do to combat the sex haul or the temptation problem that's on them that day? It seems like every time that I've done that, I've tried to propose to shield the sick man from whatever temptation is going on. It has always been doomed to failure. So for me, I try to look at it in that respect as well as I do what the book's telling me here. If the alcoholic tries to shield himself away or or the sexaholic, now he may succeed with that for a time, but he'll usually wind up in a bigger explosion than ever. We've tried these methods. These attempts to do the impossible have always failed. And that has definitely been the case with me. And I'm sure many sexaholics on this call can agree. Anytime we try to do that, we always fail. The way out is through is what my sponsor tells me. And I, he's absolutely right. So our rule is not to avoid a place where there is drinking if we have a legitimate reason for being there. This includes bars, nightclubs, dances, receptions, wedding even plain, ordinary whoopee parties. To a person who has had experience with the alcoholic, this may seem like tempting providence, but it isn't. There again, I'm I'm not going to do that here. You will note that we've made an important qualification, therefore ask yourself on each occasion this one question. Do I have any good social business or personal reason for going to this place? And I can do that today, whether I'm about to click on the Internet for work or whatever it is. Do I have any good reason for doing what I'm about to do here? Or am I expecting to steal a little vicarious pleasure from the atmosphere of such a place? If you answer these questions satisfactorily, you need to have no apprehension. Go or stay away, whichever seems best. But be sure you are on solid spiritual ground before you start and that your motive is going to be thoroughly good. And I think no matter where I go to work with another person, that's one question that I really need to keep in mind right there. What is my motive for being here? Am I on good spiritual ground? I don't need need to ask myself this. I need to ask my sponsor this as well. Do you think that I'm ready to do this? Do not think of what you will get out of the occasion. Now this refers to, for me, meetings as well. I used to, man, I really didn't get a whole lot out of that meeting. That guy, you know, he really didn't say that much. And I can remember one of my sponsors telling me through the years, whenever you can go to a meeting and you can think of what you can bring to that meeting rather than what you can get, then I think your experience with that meeting is going to change. And that's exactly what it's saying there. Do not think of what you'll get out of the occasion. Think of what you can bring to it. But if you're shaky, you'd better work with another alcoholic instead. So why sit with a long face in places where there's drinking, sighing about the good old days? If it's a happy occasion, try to increase the pleasure of those there. If a business occasion, go attend to your business enthusiastically. Now, I do that today whenever, you know, 
I let them know that alcohol doesn't agree with me. You know, if they keep on, I tell them why. And it doesn't take them very long after that not to ask me to drink anymore. Once I share a little bit of my story with somebody about what drinking has caused me and will cost them if we drink together, then I usually don't have any more problems with them asking me to drink. I can remember saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to end up drunk. We're going to end up with the police being called. You know, there, there's not going to be any clothes left on anybody, this and that. And, and I remember a guy saying, my God, or it was a lady who said, my God, that happens to you every time you drink. And I said, no, ma'am, that will happen to you if I begin to drink. And it's just I'm very crazy whenever it comes to alcohol. So, you know, there's no need in me trying to pretend <laughs> that, uh, that I can be there to drink at all. So if you are a person who wants to eat in a bar, by all means, go along. Let your friends know that they should not change their habits on your account. At a proper time and a place, explain to your friends why alcohol or lust and acting out disagrees with you. If you do this thoroughly, few people will ask you to drink. That's my experience I just shared about. And while I was drinking, acting out, doing what I was doing, I was withdrawing from life little by little. But now, now I'm getting back into the social life of this world, and this was starting to happen absolutely before COVID hit. Don't start to withdraw just because your friends drink liquor, act out, or do whatever they do. What they do is their business. What I do is mine. My job now is to be at a place to where I may be of maximum helpfulness to others. Remember page 77 in this book. In fact, let's just uh, take a quick run over there real quick. And it says this, you know, uh, it talks about prejudice. Um, at the moment, we're trying to put our lives in order, but this is not in, in itself. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. And I used to run around meetings saying that all the time. You know, my main purpose is to be of maximum service to God and the people about me. And I can remember my sponsor stopping me outside the meeting saying, no, your job is to fit yourself to be of maximum service to God and the people about you. Where that journey goes from there is that's God's business, not yours. Your job is to fit yourself. And that's the thing, same thing it's saying over here. My job now is to be at a place to where I can be of maximum helpfulness to others. So never hesitate to go anywhere that you can be helpful. I have 12 step stories. I mean, good Lord from the other fellowship. It says you uh, should not hesitate to visit the most sordid spot on earth on such an errand. Keep on the firing line of life with these motives and God will keep you unharmed. And I do believe if a man was in a bad place, even the sexaholic today, that I would be able to pray about it, gather up some other people and go in and try to help him out no matter where he was at. I, I really believe that God will keep me unharmed today. I do. Now, many of us keep liquor in our homes. We often need it to carry uh, green recruits through a severe hangover. This is what I was sharing on that Monday meeting. It would probably not be a good idea for me to keep a couple of escorts around just to uh, kind of carry the green recruits. There's some severe hangovers here because I may be the one that ends up with a severe hangover. So like I say there again, we're, we're a lot of this relates to alcohol. I'm not going to apply that here. So some of it still serve it to our friends, provided they're not alcoholic. I've never really done that. Uh, some of us think we should not serve liquor to anyone. We'd never argue this question. We feel that each family, in the light of their own circumstances, ought to decide for themselves. So basically, it boils down to this. We're careful never to show intolerance or hatred of drinking as an institution. I had a cousin that died at 47 years old, and he got sober. He got sober in Narcotics Anonymous, and he hated bars. He hated everything about it. He wanted to burn everyone down in the town. And he's the kind of man that would do it. He didn't only think about it for just a little while. He would go set fire to a place pretty quick. And so we had to have a long talk with him and read this part of the book to him quite often, you know, not to show intolerance or hatred of drinking as an institution. And uh, the same way with acting out on the internet and stuff like that. So experience shows that such an attitude is really not helpful to anyone. Because really, I think the man is watching more about how I behave than what I do, the new man. Every new alcoholic looks for the spirits among us and is immensely relieved when he finds we're not witch burners. The spirit of intolerance might repel alcoholic whose lives might have been saved had it not been for such stupidity. 
we would not even do the cause of temperate drinking any good for not one drinker in a thousand likes to be told what to do about alcohol by one who hates it. And I think that applies to his here in SA just as much as it does to those in AA. Someday, we hope that AA or SA will help the public to better realization of the gravity of the alcoholic or the sexaholic problem. But we shall be of little use if our attitude is one of bitterness or hostilities. Drinkers, ex-blusters, they won't stand for it. After all, our problems were of our own making. Bottles were only a symbol. Besides, we have stopped fighting anybody or anything. Remember there on page 84, that's one of the promises of working step 10 daily. We have ceased fighting anything or anyone. And here again, it says we have to. So for me today, one of the greatest gifts in my life has been able not only to carry this message to alcoholics, but to carry this message to sexaholics. I work with more than a dozen men through this work right now. I'm reading with several of them. I've got many of them in the writing. And there is one man in Virginia that I have worked all the way through the steps. He has been through his amends. He's made all of his amends that he could make without harming anyone else. And this man has uh, begun to sponsor others and his life. has just really taken on on a new uh, chapter. I'm very grateful to have been a part of that. I look forward to moving forward in this fellowship and continuing to work the steps with new guys. I get calls from people all the time, just like a lot of you do. A lot of people say, why do you take on so many people? You shouldn't be doing that. Well, I don't know. The book, does, for one thing, doesn't give me a number of how many I should or I shouldn't. I try to give each one equal equal time as I can. The job that I have today helps me to do that quite a bit. It really does. But also, whenever you get to inventory, when we get to inventory in this work, it really starts to slow down. That opens up the door for more new guys to come in, and we just keep working as we go. I think, like it said there, that once we've been relieved, it's not only our duty, but it's our responsibility to carry this message to the meth suffering sexaholic, alcoholic, whatever the case may be. I know it has been for me. It's something that I've done for many years. I was talking to my wife just before I got on the call today. I've been doing these book studies and I've been doing these different workshops and stuff like this for close to three decades now. And it's uh, definitely been a joy in my life, but it's been more of a joy for me to come to the big book unveiled because I came here clean of a secret that I'd been hiding for 25 years. And as a result of moving through the work this time, it, it has freed me. I feel as Bill Wilson did when he said, you know, I stood at the top of the mountain like a clean wind of the mountaintop blew through and through. And that has been my experiences going through this work. Far from perfect, ask any one of my sponsees. I can still get on a rant pretty quick about different things. I try not to do that so much anymore. My character is definitely improving today. Step 10 and step 11 has been a lifesaver, a lifesaver for me. For the two steps that I avoided for 25 years, for the last 17 months, they have absolutely been lifesaving. So I encourage anybody who is new here, if you're on this call today and you're new and you're checking it out, there is a solution here. There is work to be done, though. It's not, hey, God, go ahead and do this for me and then me sit back and just wait for him to do it. So. I don't know. It doesn't take very long, really, for me today to find out if a man's going to be serious and thorough about doing the work. Put him into steps 10 and 11. It won't take very long at all to see who's going to do it and who's not. Now, it's not my business, but it is my business when they come ask me because there's a process through the book. And uh, so I'm truly grateful, truly grateful that I've been asked to do this and have had the opportunity to do this for all these weeks because it has just been a true blessing. Dennis, thank you so much for your service. This could have never, ever happened without you in the background doing all the work that you've done. So I am so grateful for you, brother, your friendship more than any of that. But the big book unveiled would not have been possible had Dennis not done the work that he done. And each of you for showing up each week and continuing to be a part of this. So there again, I'm going to I'm going to cut off a little early on it today. But I really would like to hear from those on the call. You know, has this helped? Would you attend a future workshop or something if we did something moving forward? And just your experience. You don't even need to ask me a question if you don't want to. That's fine but I do love each one of you guys. And I thank you for my recovery and my sobriety today. And I tell you, my wife does as well. She's been very, very, very ill from COVID. We were very scared that we were going to lose her. So thank all of you for your prayers 
Had it not been for that, I was wanting her to come in and share just a little bit today, but she's still pretty weak and not able to do that. So uh, I would really love to hear from you if possible. And man, I'm just grateful I had this opportunity. Dennis, thank you again, brother. Love you.